Hey everyone, welcome to Simplexity, where we simplify the complexities of life and bring a little curiosity and contemplation to meaningful, sometimes difficult conversations. I'm your host, Allison Stoner. Warning, the introduction contains mature content that could be triggering. In July 2017, I was standing in a rehabilitation center for malnourished children in Somalia, witnessing how the drought and rising temperatures are displacing millions of East African families. There were about eight hospital beds, all holding babies whimpering in distress, their moms sitting in plastic chairs waiting for an understaffed medical team to revive infants with oxygen masks and limited resources. One child was in critical condition, naked, belly bloated, arms the circumference of a pool stick. Their family had grown accustomed to splitting a single meal between the two parents and eight children for the entire day. Occasionally, emergency water or food trucks would come to their camp, but it was nowhere near sufficient for the extreme pain and poverty that defined their existence. I didn't really understand the impact of climate change on humanity until the child passed away, and without a moment to grieve, the mom went home, returning to chores and walking miles to retrieve whatever water and supplies she could find to provide for her surviving family. I felt the weight of my willful ignorance, knowing we've been living on the same planet and I've considered her family little to never when making my daily decisions. By no matter how many degrees of separation, my soul knows all of our lives influenced the fate of her family by our collective behaviors and systems and so on. Just then, I felt a tap on my shoulder and a voice gently said, time's up. Stunned and disoriented, I reached to my head and removed a headset. That's right, I'm actually in Oslo, Norway, at a conference discussing the future. I'm not in Somalia. I've never physically been there. This visit to the rehabilitation center was made possible entirely through virtual reality. A technology company created a fully immersive, experiential, four-part documentary series showing how the world is falling more out of balance and the subsequent ramifications. Today, we're unpacking this modern technology of virtual reality and the significant ways our guest is utilizing it. First, let me give you a rundown and some background information. The general definition of virtual reality is an artificial computer-generated simulation of an environment that is intended to be interacted with in a seemingly real and physical manner, like a stand-in for our reality. As opposed to looking at a screen in front of you, VR places you inside the experience, and it is often primarily sensed through sight and sound. This makes it highly immersive, transporting, and full of potential. A common rig includes an HMD, or head-mounted display, but my technical term for it is goggle helmet headband thing. You may have seen a version of a goggle helmet headband thing in Spielberg's Ready Player One, although current models aren't quite as lightweight and wireless without any external hardware, but we're getting there. The HMD constantly tracks your movement and orientation with a a whole bunch of sensors that connect to a software. When you look left, right, up, or down, it determines the view of your virtual reality that you should see. For my geeks and freaks, some of these sensors are called accelerometers and gyroscopes, and I probably only mispronounced one of those. The tricky part of VR is that the tech can't miss a beat. If you experience some lag or latency or other areas, it might lead to motion sickness or a total letdown for remembering you're not actually at Justin Bieber's birthday party. When VR feels like showing off, sometimes data gloves, immersive rooms, wands, controllers, and other equipment enhance the illusion and provide more modes of feedback like haptics, the use of touch to communicate. It's easy to see how VR could lead to total fantasy and escapism, but engineers, scientists, creators, and tons of industries have grander ideas that will make life even more vivid. VR can be used by travel marketers and hotels to give tourists a taste of what they can expect on their visit, while those who cannot make the trek get to surf in Hawaii anyway. 
educators can use powerful visualizations and better online classrooms to increase student engagement and knowledge retention, and maybe even take them to virtual labs or on field trips. VR can help calm PTSD symptoms in soldiers, combat anxiety and phobias, and therapists can treat clients using virtual reality exposure therapy. Medical students can practice surgery without cadavers. People with autism can develop social skills. It can treat amputees dealing with phantom limb pain. Olympic athletes can train for events. Companies can test run new procedures and see how their employees react. NASA can complete complicated actions. You can go to a sweaty rave in the morning, be in a porno in the afternoon, and a six by nine prison cell in solitary confinement by bedtime, perceiving every sight and sound along the way. You can see what it's like waking up in someone else's body and bedroom and be in an active war zone fleeing alongside refugees. You can witness historical reenactments, go to a VR gym where working out may be a little more fun when Sergey, your personal trainer, just squats next to you. There can be virtual land exchange, entertainment, apps, currencies, securities. For me, I would explore the cosmos because Space Jam. As long as I don't experience headaches or too much eye strain. See, there are some health concerns and ethical issues we have to be mindful of, like this list, which is largely pulled from Fiona McAvoy and VentureBeat, including sensory vulnerability, desensitization, social isolation, overestimating one's abilities while using VR, <laughs> psychiatric responses, unpalatable fantasies, torture virtual criminality, deciding what is and is not appropriate for roaming and recreation, privacy and data, distorting mental maps, and extended play leading to hallucinations and even creation of seemingly real memories. The good news? That's what anticipatory technology ethics and responsible research and innovation are for. The bad news? The people who are designing what is fair and safe come to the table with their own implicit biases and skewed views and filters. We all have our own vantage point. And that, my friends, brings us to today's guest and what she's doing to help the cause. Morgan Mercer is the founder and CEO of Vantage Point, the premier enterprise training platform. It was founded under the belief that while technology can cause apathy, immersive technology can drive empathy, fundamentally making the world more human and lead to fairer, safer, more equitable communities, workplaces, and organizations. Vantage Point uses technology to teach and inspire people to become the very best versions of themselves by providing training in EQ-driven skills and soft skills, beginning with tackling workplace anti-sexual harassment training and spanning to diversity and inclusion, empathy training, and beyond. As you can surmise, these can help unpack racial, gender, disability, LGBTQIA+, bias, and discrimination, assess the workplace in terms of leadership, bullying, and more. I am thrilled to hear all your expertise. Thanks for being patient during that long introduction. Morgan, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it was a long... The introduction was lovely. I loved it. It was <laughs> such a compelling story. I wanted to hear Good, more. Good. Great. So. <laughs> like coming to a theater near you, virtual reality theater. Um, so <laughs> first, um, can you tell me a mini backstory of what led you to found Vantage Point, mm -hmm. um, what the process has been like, and the problems that you're hoping to solve with it. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a biracial female. I was born in the South. I was born in North Carolina. And half my family are Trump supporters. The other half my family are not. They're Democrats and liberals. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so my yeah. parents are very divorced. I had a very interesting upbringing. And I was raised in a small town. I was born in Charlotte, but raised in Apex. And so Growing up as a biracial mm -hmm. female in the South, I thought I've been exposed to everything. I mean, I heard people would come up to me and they would say, your hair doesn't smell like a black girl's hair. Mm -hmm. I've had people say, you know, this guy won't date you because you're half black, whatever it may be, right? And mm -hmm. so I'm thinking I'm free from bias. There's no way I have bias. I've seen it all. I've heard it all. I've experienced it all. And so I move abroad. And I befriend somebody who's ethnically Ethiopian, but born in Sweden. We would go out and she had this beautiful hair mm -hmm. and people would just touch her and be like, that's not your real hair. And people would be like, you're not from Sweden. I have to see your ID. There's no way you're, I don't believe you're from Sweden. Right. And so I saw all of this, right? But 
I myself, again, thinking I'm free from bias. I've seen it all. I've heard it all. I've experienced half of it or, or a lot of it, right? Yeah. And so we're coming back on a train from Cinque Terre, and I'm seated to her left, and we're looking out of the window. And I casually make this comment. It was more so a joke, right? I laughed it off in mm-hmm. passing, and I thought she was going to laugh along with me. And she looked at me, and the room got really, like, the train got really silent. And she looked at me, and she stopped. And she just kind of stared at me for half a second. And I was like, okay, something's wrong. And she was like, I can't believe you would say something so ignorant. I have so much respect for you and I value you so much as a friend and as a person. I just can't believe something like that would come out of your mouth. Wow. And I froze and I was like, wow. I don't, number one, I don't even know what, you know, I, what said. I said. Mm-hmm. And then number two, like, how do I respond, right? You can't just say, oh, I'm sorry and expect somebody to say it's okay. Right. And so I took that and I internalized it and I thought about it and I reflected on it. And she you know, came to me later and she told me why it was impactful and her family had been impacted by it. It was around immigration. Mm. Her family had been impacted by it. It had been something that she had personally experienced. Yeah. And she was like, you know, it, it's so hurtful to hear right. you say something and something like that. And so I had to take that and I had to sit and really think. And I came back with a really formal apology. But then I educated myself on what I didn't know right. and, and you know, learned about the problem. And so as I took that, I realized how impactful that was. And it's not like these things that we're now talking about are recent issues, right? We've always had racism and bias right. and lack of equitable views and harassment and all of these problems. And it's that we have to feel like we personally relate to a problem in order to feel compelled enough to question our attitudes, question our behaviors, potentially make a change. So I was like, how do I take someone I know, someone I grew up with, who sits on the other side of the table and literally put them on the other side of the table and let them have the same experience to some of these problems that I feel so passionate about? Mm. And so that launched the idea for the company. I woke up with the idea. I'm not even kidding you. Back in 2016, before Hashtag Me Too, before standalone VR, and everyone was like, what are you doing? You're crazy. But I ended Were you up in being this crazy. field already? No. <laughs> I know. I know. Everyone was like, what are you doing? And I ended up being crazy enough to actually do it. Mm. So, yeah. And why VR versus non-VR training? Yeah, absolutely. So as you know, you so eloquently said, I have this belief that technology can drive apathy, but immersive technology can build empathy, right? And so it's really... Existing training methods aren't necessarily effective in the ways that we're hoping. There Mm -hmm. are a variety of reasons for that. So the the psychological term that it's rooted in is called state-dependent learning. Mm -hmm. And so state-dependent learning means you need to actually learn under the same circumstances that would be present if the situation were to occur. Right. Right. And so that's why fighter pilot simulations are so effective in VR. That's why surgical training is so effective in VR, because you can actually use haptic cues Mm -hmm. to simulate the response you would get versus actually doing it in person. It's the closest thing you'll have to a real experience. Without causing undue injury and harm. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there are a variety of reasons. Basically, you need to be immersed in an environment, right? You need to actually feel like you relate to the problem without external stimuli or internal stimuli, Mm -hmm. right? And so when you have external or internal stimuli present, then it's going to influence the way that you view the problem Mm -hmm. in a way that differs from the way you would actually respond to the problem in real life. And so we actually had a really famous HR industry analyst, Josh Burzen, give us a really excellent example. And Mm -hmm. it was basically you're simulating a car crash. So you're behind the wheel of a car, you're driving a car, and in that two seconds, you're not thinking, are you turning to the left? Are you turning to the right? Are you hitting the deer? Or are you, you know, hitting on your brakes and hitting the car behind you? You're not thinking, what did I learn in driver's ed? You're thinking about, you know, I'm stressed. There's, I have two seconds to make the right decision. What's going to have the least negative impact, right? And so when you're in that situation, you really need to be trained under very similar conditions in order to make the right decision. Mm. And then secondary to that, it's that we can't explain a feeling. So I can't sit across the table from you and tell you what it feels like to feel happy, sad, scared, cold, etc. Right. Feelings mm-hmm. are deeply steeped in personal context and, and personal relation. Mm-hmm. And so for me to explain that to you, while you may know what sadness feels like, sadness to you is very different from sadness to me. Mm-hmm. And so how do we create a shared perspective around a problem and train people on what they did wrong or, mm-hmm. or what they could do better or where they could empathize more mm-hmm. and then create a more inclusive and aware community? And that's something that really only lends itself to either experiencing something or being within a VR headset. And so you're working in the realm of cognitive bias. Mm -hmm. What is cognitive bias and in what ways and where does it show up 
specifically in the workplace? So there are 175 types of biases, (laughs) right? Just that? Yeah, I know, right? (laughs) Only 175. Casual. (laughs) But, you know, biases are ultimately heuristics. So they're patterns that your brain uses in terms of creating a shortcut to reach information or reach a decision, right? And so that is obviously going to lend itself to a subset of problems, especially when you're filtering through information based on what you're used to, what you've experienced, Mm -hmm. what you've been environmentally conditioned by, whatever it may be, right? And so that shows up in you know, confirmation bias or even in bias and hiring practices. We tend to hire people who look like us. We tend to like people who look like us, who talk like us. Mm -hmm. We tend to see things as we are, not as they are, Mm -hmm. right? And so all of reality is ultimately, I mean, we live in like a reality distortion (laughs) field. Reality is as we see it, not as it is. And Mm -hmm. so when we see inequality or we see injustice, we see injustice or inequality as it relates to us or pertains to us or something we've experienced Mm -hmm. and not necessarily the same way somebody else would see it, Mm -hmm. right? And so when we look at the problems we're seeing in the workplace today around diversity, equity, inclusion, Mm -hmm. and it's important that we use the term equity and not equality, Right. Those are two very different things. Equality is basically, if, I don't know if you've ever seen that meme or that image where you have the fence, the tall fence, right? And you have a short person and a tall person. So equality would be giving them both the same size ladder and the short person still can't see over the fence and the tall person can, mm. right? Equity is giving the short person a tall ladder and the tall person a short ladder so they both can see eye to eye over the fence. Wow. And that's the difference, right? Hmm. So. Equality is giving two people the same thing, regardless of the circumstances, conditions, backgrounds, et cetera, environmental factors. Right. Equity is making sure that every single person has an equal seat at the table. And and contextualizes their lived experience. Exactly. So VR's superpower is leading the user to believe that they have entered a new world. What is the world that Vantage Point creates and how do your programs look and feel and work? Absolutely. So VR is based upon presence and immersion, right? So you have to feel like you are immersed in the environment and you raised a really great point. Any sort of lag in video quality or any sort of lag in the the viewing experience, any sort of odd UX within Mm -hmm. the training program or any program can remind you that you are in an immersive experience, right? And so it reduces the efficacy of the program and it reduces the feeling of immersion. And so what we do is we use photorealistic characters that actually look at you. We use invasion of personal space, tonality, a lot of the contextual clues that make up the majority of the problem. Because what we actually see is that when it comes to things like bullying based on perceived sexual orientation or harassment or whatever it is, it might look fine on paper, but it comes down to the context of the situation, right. the power dynamic, the tone in which it was said, mm-hmm. right, the dynamic of the room, whatever it may be. And that's stuff that you really can't communicate right. you know, in a black and white manner. So we actually use photorealistic characters that look at you talk to you they'll actually yeah raise their eyebrows like they're waiting for you to say something especially as things escalate if you don't and as you speak out or don't the situation will branch it either gets better or worse so it's a lot more true to life with the way that things actually happen right if you speak up sooner situations better if you speak up later situations worse and so we're teaching people there's no right or wrong there are levels of right or wrong and there's always a way to be better to be a better upstander to speak out better to be more aware whatever it may be right and then we train you around what you did wrong at the end you get actually a mentor phone call okay and then we give you analytics on the portal at the very end around areas where you might not be understanding so we show things like you know your workforce population said that they showed very high confidence levels around this topic but actually really low comprehension scores or wow. out of the different types of problems, right? Microaggressions versus gaslighting. Mm. Your employees actually really understand microaggressions, but they don't understand gaslighting. Hmm. Oh, I want to go through this training. Yeah, like, totally. Right I'm done. Now. Yeah. <laughs> Let me whip out my VR headset. I know. I'm like, all right, team, it's time for a field trip. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. So since you are administering bias training, I have to ask what steps does your company take to yeah. create its own accountability markers so we aren't simply swapping one bias with another? Like who who designs your curriculum yeah. and how do you prevent the interface and the data processing and algorithms from being biased? Yeah, I'm so passionate about this. <laughs> so numerous ways, right? Yeah. So talking about the program design, number one is we brought in a ton of subject matter experts. We brought in people from the cognitive sciences side, behavioral sciences side, trauma-informed communications experts to make sure that 
every single line within the scripts. None of it was leading Mm -hmm. because that's important that everything was trauma informed. None of it was triggering. We actually interviewed survivors, people who've spoken out. We pulled things from case law, factuality to make sure it was real. And we went through a very extensive content review process Yeah, because I think that it actually needs to come into the program design. And part of that, too, which is, you know, one of the things I'm very passionate about, especially given the ecosystem and landscape, is that in order to build non-biased programs, you have to make sure that you have diversity behind the scenes, Mm -hmm. right? And so you're actually getting a diversity of perspectives from men, from women, from different genders, from different, you know, ethnicities, from different upbringings, from different sexual orientations, Mm -hmm. because if you're not getting a diversity of perspectives looking at your program that you're building or building the program, then you're going to build bias into it because that's the way it works. Right. So, you know, we take that very seriously. And I feel like always leaving room for feedback, right? You're constantly probably receiving testimonials, but also critical feedback and looking for ways, hopefully, I I can't project, but hopefully (laughs) for you to continually improve your product and service. Because at the heart of it, you're putting, you know, the future of humanity on the line. It's fine. No pressure. (laughs) Casual, just trying to save us, but I want to save us the right way. So I totally feel you. And I know that I'm passionate about trying to create my own products and services with Mm -hmm. that informed lens of going into it so that on the backside, I'm not just, you know, ultimately perpetuating the same problem or causing unnecessary Mm -hmm. harm to people who weren't considered when I was first, you know, developing the product. Yeah. So when you're using the the training, are you specifically examining the individual's behavior? I know you said you're giving them some analytics. Are you ever assessing the company's overall mm-hmm. processes and like their initiatives to see if there's yeah. bias there? Yeah, it's so interesting because, you know, when you look at it for any, for example, for any type of harassment training to actually be effective and stick within an organization, a few things have to be present. One is that the executives of the company or the leaders of the company actually have to show that they care, that they're committed to it and that it's important, right? So mm-hmm. it doesn't matter how effective your training is, if your leaders of your company don't show that publicly, right it's not going to stick. It's not going to be right. you know, effective within your organization. The second thing is that you actually have to have procedures, policies, systems, reporting avenues that support it. Right. And so it's, it's interesting because, yes, we do give individual feedback and then we do give company feedback as well. But awesome. what's actually come out of it, we do a variety of different things depending on the company. One is that we do facilitate discussion questions or, you know, facilitate discussions afterwards. Mm-hmm. It's really unique because you'll have a group of 15 to 30 people. We're actually doing one with 200 people soon. Yeah. Which will be an interesting conversation having that many perspectives right at once. But it's making sure everyone gets the equal opportunity to raise their hand and contribute. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. And you have the time to actually hold space for the conversation in the way that you need to. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when you have all of these different perspectives coming to the table, you can start to ask people questions like, okay, well, your storyline branched differently because of what you did. Why did you think that way? And so as we're having these conversations, we actually had a company where there was a guy who was, you know, black and gay. And Mm -hmm. his colleagues were saying things to him, you know, but not out of malicious intent, more so because I guess they just they thought it was fine or for whatever reason. Sometimes in jest, thinking that the humor will build camaraderie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And, you know, and so he was about to leave the company and Mm. this came out during the facilitated discussion. And ultimately what the company was able to do was they were able to realize they needed to open up more channels of communication, more reporting avenues and revisit their policies. So, you know, moving forward what we're doing is we are looking at the information we're collecting at a global aggregate, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really important network intelligence to show cross industry, cross country, cross company, that sort of thing. But then also partnering with companies to work with them to evaluate, you know, okay, if this is working, but there are some areas where things aren't going well and even looking at benchmarks longitudinally, so things like retention or increased right. um, representation or whatever it may be, right. you know, if things aren't going the way they need to be, then obviously something else has to change as well. And I was going to ask about the aftercare and follow-up because yeah. I think some people look at training as something to check off the list and then it's complete, but really it's just mm-hmm. the beginning of lifelong self-work and company improvement. So 
do you upfront explain, hey, we're going to call and check in, you know, six weeks from now, a year from now? What does aftercare look like? Yeah, absolutely. I love that. So we build in metrics of success into the programs that we deploy. Cool. So we never just say like, hey, here's our product. Yeah. We're done. Congrats. Right? Our hands, yeah, our hands are clean. You bought from us. We literally build out metrics of success. And that's cool. in part around the type of training we're doing, whether it's harassment or bias training in the future, looking at other areas. Nice. Or, you know, by the company. And we actually will say, okay, we want 70% or 80% or 90% of your employees to rank this. We want to see an increase in reports or we want to see an increase in retention or whatever it is over the next year, two years, three years. Great. And that's how we actually metric ourselves awesome. for whether or not we're being effective. Love that. So, oh, yeah. love to hear that. <laughs> um, so unconscious bias itself is responsible for $64 billion dollars annually, like issues related to it. And that's according to a report from the Center for American Progress. Do you know, I'm trying to think, what damage makes up $64 billion? And what other incentives beyond saving money do you use to convince businesses mm -hmm. to shift from unconscious bias to conscious inclusion? So a variety of different things. One is lack of retention, high employee turnover, right? Okay. The second would be any sort of emotional damages, any sort of punitive damages. So if somebody sues you um, or sues their manager, whatever it may be, and obviously lawsuit settlements are very expensive. Right. Actually providing repercussionary training as a company if something happens. Yeah. And then the other side of that too is the cost of innovation. And so one of the biggest things around building a business case for DNI or DEI, you know, that we've seen both within the space and we've also used some of these statistics to show companies like, hey, this is an important problem, right. you know, and and quantifiably important for those of you that care, but it's important regardless of, of the financial right, cost. Right, yeah. You know, but it's it's the case for inclusion because when you actually look at it, inclusive teams financially outperform inclusive teams or teams that have a variety of different perspectives they're bringing to the table have right. more innovative ideas, right? right. Um, and so there are actually studies that have been shown by McKinsey and others around the financial impact of not having inclusive teams within right. your organization. Adapt so or die, my friends. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Couldn't have said it better. I think I might say it, I might say it that way next time. Yeah. Just make sure you keep the Thank my you. friends in there. Yeah, yeah. And I'll make sure I give Soften credit where blood. credit's due. Yeah, yeah whatever. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Love it. As one of my friends said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. Adapt um, or die. die. <laughs> yes. Love it. So, you know, there's obviously the business case. But then aside from that, it's kind of like companies know that they need to care. Mm -hmm. Right. And so customers think, are demanding it, too. Yeah. Customers and users. Right. Trainees, employees, just the general audience of people. I think the biggest problem that we see, though, is that a lot of times when you look at, and, and this is just me being transparent, a lot of times when you look at DNI or you talk to DNI and you talk to HR teams, it's like they say, we know we care, we know it's important, yep. but it's convincing our CFO, it's convincing our CEO, right. it's creating a business case for it internally. Right. And then the other issue is that a lot of times, DNI, like chief DNI officers, are minority women mm -hmm. or minorities, you know, and they always belong to marginalized communities. Right. But oftentimes they're one of the only marginalized communities represented on the executive team of a company. Exactly. And that's the biggest problem. Right. Because how do you create internal stakeholders and champions around it if you are bringing your voice to the table representing your population within exactly. the company? Right. And I want to ask more about DNI and the other forms of training that you offer. And I have more questions across the board, but first we are going to take a break. All right, welcome back. We're here hanging out with Morgan Mercer talking about VR and making the world a better place, but like practically, literally, effectively, and measurably. So I just want to ask before anything else, are there specific conditions that make the training more effective for people or less effective? People will ask, OK, well, the benefit is empathy building, right? So why don't you do a first person simulation? Why don't you actually let somebody know what it feels like to feel harassed or to feel like the victim of bias? And we always say no, because ultimately with the training, because it's so effective, because it's so immersive, that's likely to be triggering. And it's likely right. to be triggering even for people who might think that they've never experienced harassment or bias, because mm. you have to think about um, from a psychological perspective in the current landscape that we're in, 
so many people just kind of push it down Mm -hmm. and don't think about it again. Yep. Um, And so if you ever did a first person simulation, it would cause a ton of trauma for a majority of your viewers. Right. And so when you're building with a technology, you have to think about these sorts of things. It's not just about the content or the development of the product, the UX. It's about the way that you're applying the technology to the concepts. Right. That's critical. And I myself am still uncovering internalized discrimination, racism, prejudice, but then also toward myself, things that I didn't realize I have actually experienced. I Mm -hmm. just colored them a different way Mm -hmm. um, as memories. And now when I had a more extreme case Mm -hmm. come up, I realized, wait, this is actually a pattern that's been happening. And I just I wasn't aware of it. Um, So I, I read somewhere that expecting your workforce or supervisor or whatever the the role in the company is to overcome their biases just because unconscious bias training has made them aware of them is akin to expecting them to eat a healthy diet because they know how to do it and should. What are the greatest concerns, challenges, and points of resistance to this kind of VR training? It's so important to build an upstander culture. Like it is so important to build an upstander culture. It's so important to realize that if you see something and you don't do something or say something, it's just as bad as doing the action itself. And I think that's true of anything, right? If you see a homeless person being yelled at on the street and you don't say anything, you just watch it happen and you walk away or whatever. And you you think it doesn't affect you. Yeah. It does. Then you are a part of the problem because you're watching evil and not or or watching an evil action. You're complicit with it. Exactly. And not doing anything. Um, You know, but secondary to that, When it comes to the challenges and concerns within a company and points of resistance, it's really interesting because a lot of times people are scared of what they don't understand. Right. Um, Fear what they don't know. Exactly. And with any sort of new technology or new modality of training or new anything, there can be fear around it for Mm -hmm. whatever reason. It could be fear of putting the headset on. It could be fear of like, well, I've heard so many interesting things about like the technology from 10 years ago, people getting sick. You know, I don't want to try it. Right. It could be fear of, well, I don't know what's going to happen if I stick my hand up and I support this and then my other, you know, senior executives don't like it or it doesn't go well. Yeah, you can be ostracized in your company for wanting to do the right thing. Exactly. And so we have to overcome, we have to work with a lot of these challenges and actually sit with our stakeholders and understand what are you hoping for? What are your hopes and expectations? What are you afraid of? Right. Right. And how can we work with you to address that and make sure it's a success? Right. Are there any sore spots that you're very aware still need improvement? Whether it's your particular training, which I know you don't want to go out and say, hey, here's, <laughs> here are our, our flaws, um, but just VR training in general. Yeah, a few areas. The first is VR training in general. There's a lot of VR training. It's not all good. There's a variety of reasons for that. One is like a lot of times people are like, well, can't you just use the Google Cardboard? No, <laughs> you know, you actually need unique quality. Right. Um, it depends on how the program's designed, the quality of the content, the quality of the deployment process, the quality of the actual experience of getting somebody into the headset. Yeah. Um, it's not all good. And so I would say that a lot of the flaws of VR training or VR in general on the market is that when people try a VR experience, of the time, it's not a great experience, and then 50% of the time it is. And so people form these negative perceptions of it, right? Mm. The other issue, too, is that so much of it perpetuates bias, Um, you know, so actually in terms of embodiment, because embodiment's a core aspect of VR, embodiment of an over-sexualized female character actually leads to more tolerant behavior of rape myth stereotypes, Mm. meaning that it doesn't matter if you're a girl or a guy, I could literally be a female playing a video game and I'm embodying an over-sexualized female character, I'm more likely to leave the game and go out into the real world and see a girl and say, you know, well, she was dressed like this, so she deserved this behavior because that's the kind of behavior it's psychologically, cognitively. Reinforcing. Know, exactly. And so when you think about how VR has been leveraged historically for some of the different categories, yeah. not to get vulgar, but, you know, the porn industry, gaming, et cetera. Right. It, it creates problems. And so mm-hmm. I would say that those are a few of the problems that we're facing with VR as a whole, right, yeah. in the VR space. And then I would say what's interesting is that as a company, we're always iterating and we're always, you know, improving. Mm-hmm. Um, so a few areas where we've had to improve are in our deployment processes. I mean, at first we were like, everyone buys a headset. All the companies buy the headsets right. themselves, right? It's easy. And then we realized, like, no, it's not. Right. That doesn't work. 
Um, a few other areas. <laughs> Eager. Are, yeah, it, it just it doesn't work, right? And a few other areas are that. It's interesting because, you know, I always I love putting people into VR for the first time. So I always see them like clutch their heart, shake their heads. But then it's always interesting to hear feedback that that they give us. And I remember one time specifically, it was about a year ago, but somebody came out of the experience. They were like, I don't like the fact that, um, you know, Sasha was the one who was told to take notes. And it was a part of the experience that we built in, mm. you know, and, and we built it in that way because it was we were supposed to be showing microaggressions, gaslighting of like the male character throwing the notepad at Sasha. But it was like we didn't even realize that we had kind of built in bias to the experience right. when we were teaching about microaggressions and gaslighting because we made this young female email the note taker right right and so it's Which like from you can one view yeah. someone could say hey at least you included a female yeah. but then also looking at the position and the yeah. function of the character yeah. in context exactly and so mm. within the way that we wow. had casted and we wrote you know the the scenario the scene yeah we actually had kind of like built in bias into the character without realizing it when we're trying to teach about gaslighting right so did you change the character? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're like, note taken, never to be done again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nobody takes notes. No notes are taken ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So let's talk a little bit more about diversity and inclusion. I think those are, you know, hot buzzwords right now. Mm -hmm. um, but you mentioned a few things already about it. I think speaking as a white person, I recognize that uh, I've, I've witnessed myself and others, uh, other white people, hiring a person of color and then thinking that that means our company culture is diverse and inclusive. Mm -hmm. Why is that a total misnomer? And how can that be really dangerous for those who are wanting to do the right thing but not realizing it goes a lot further than that? Oh my gosh, that makes me so angry. I, I know. Yeah. I know. It and I'm happy so to angry. add my two cents, but I also want to give you a chance to to speak if you want. Yeah, yeah. I, I would love to hear your two cents too. Sure. It makes me so, so, so angry because when you actually look at it, the numbers are still so far off. We're like 202 years, right? That's the most recent statistic from true inclusion and true, you know, equality. Um, and so it's so screwed when you look at, I mean, like even taking it, sorry, a completely left field direction, but the amount of venture capital funding that goes towards minorities and women. It's like 2%, and I, right? Yeah, no, less, so it's 2%, but for black women, it is 0.0006%. 0.0006%. I'm not okay. even kidding. When and I they say two? less than 1%. They <sighs> say less than 1%. And it's a gross overestimation. So all of like my female Latina VCs or my female, you know, minority VCs, it's yeah. like they are literally part of a group of a dozen, right? right? And same for any sort of like minority or female founded companies. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk to people, whether it be, you know, about their executive team or the conferences they're putting together and they have a black person or right. a Latino, Latina person or a, you know, female or whatever it is. And they're like, oh, well, we have an inclusive, Oy. you know, culture or event or program or portfolio or whatever it is. And it's no, like, you no, you literally tokenism. have one. Yeah. Yeah. You have one. Exactly. You have a token. And because you have a token, you are perpetuating the problem as well because you're not actually looking at why you know, you're making some of these choices and the fact that we are still so far from where we need to be. Right. Something we talk about across different episodes is, and by we, I mean me, because it's just <laughs> me, is cultural competency. Because mm -hmm. I myself am trying to increase my awareness uh, of being more culturally competent in all my endeavors and just everyday conversations. But I think that's the thing is, again, it's easy for me to, to speak just from the white perspective. If I hire a person of color, it does not mean, first, that they represent the totality of what it means to be a person of color. And second, that I have done my work to engage them in a way that is fair communication, that I mm -hmm. have made an effort to understand where they may be coming from mm -hmm. and doing work in advance to self-educate. Instead, I'm just checking the box. Mm -hmm. So let's say then someone goes through your training and you recognize that the employee is racist. At what point do you suggest that it goes straight to firing? Do you try and give them time to improve their behavior, you know, to, potentially to the detriment of other people's safety in the process? Like, how do you maneuver something that delicately and also not make sure you're discriminating against who gets fired and stays 
on board. I love that because it raises so many ethical concerns. I know. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of ethical concerns there. One is like individual user privacy, right? So as an individual user, what are your rights to privacy when you're going through something and going through an experience? Mm. And so we get a lot of companies that are like, okay, well, if you can potentially flag somebody as a you know, future harasser or future mm-hmm. racist within the company, can you do that? And can we just fire them and let them go? So number one, the thing I say is that by just firing them and letting them go, they're actually just going to go to another company and create the same problem. So we actually need a shift in behavior, a shift in attitudes. Mm -hmm. Um, And then number two, the other side of the coin is if you don't do anything, then they're just perpetuating their behaviors, their attitudes. So where I foresee us moving, what we basically do is we build in training. So we will continuously train people around the problems they have. So if you go through an experience or a training module and you – are a lot more self-aware or a lot more, you know, empathetic or whatever it may be, you're going to have a shorter training experience. Hmm. What I foresee us moving to as a society is a predictive training format where everything is user curated. And as we're detecting these things, the actual training that you see changes down to exactly down to the characters you're talking to, down to the voices, down to pretty much every single aspect. And so moving away from kind of these these blanket training mandates. Right. And that's something that only the technology can do. Right. Are we there yet? No. No. And so even our, our training is imperfect in a way because we build in additional training for the people who, you know, could be racist or right, harassers. Right. But at the same time, we're not going so far as to say we recognize that you are racist against black people versus these other ethnicities. Right. So we're going to modify the training so you're interacting with black characters of various different backgrounds, right? Right. right. Whether it be well off or coming from you know, a very impoverished community, we're right. not actually modifying our trainings that way yet. So I would say that no program on the market's perfect right, right now. Yeah, I mean, AI, you're, you're training consciousness, but yeah. then once it has its own consciousness, it will begin to behave on its own, and you you want to make sure that it, you know. Like Twitter. It, yeah. <laughs> like the, the, Twitter, the Twitter fiasco. Uh, what do you, of the, what was There that? was like some AI bot that rolled out on Twitter, and then basically the users within uh, the community it like taught it to be biased. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and I have some other other intel from from friends now that mm-hmm. I it's helping me understand just the severity of this mm-hmm. and the implications globally. Yeah. So getting it right and continual refinement are just they're imperative. Yeah. Well, it's building in it's building technology ethically, as you mentioned before. Yeah. And so the other side of that too is like. We hear a lot of questions around, okay, well, so what's the minimum number of employees that I can aggregate it? Can I drill down if I do want to, you know, whatever it is. So the way that we think about it is it's continuous learning, continuous improvement, because as you're sitting across from me and you're saying that you're working on being, you know, more aware. I also, even as a minority, you know, biracial female, there Mm -hmm. are still so many areas that I'm not aware of because I wasn't raised under those those conditions or in that environment or whatever it may be. I haven't experienced it. Right. Typically, you know, one thing that you find is the most marginalized communities, meaning you are a minority and also a member of an LGBTQ community or whatever it may be, when you come from two marginalized communities combined, Mm -hmm. you face a completely different set of biases or, you know, problems than somebody who comes from one of those communities. And so, you know, there are still things that I'm working on being more aware of. Yeah. That are so layers. Yeah, exactly. The layers of the problem. And so we consider it continuous improvement, continuous development. And so part of that is when we put people into the headset, you know, we want the training to go on in the headset because we don't want people to necessarily feel like when I take this headset off, like I can't act as myself in this training program Mm because when I take the headset off, I'm going to get fired. We want people to act as themselves right. and display that they have problems so we can train them around it. Right. But I think it comes down to building mm. the technology to you know, mitigate the problem by way of effective training. And I think that that's something yeah. where we're not there yet. The technology is not there yet. But I do foresee us and the world being there in the future. Yeah, if, if employees know that their employment is on the line going into it, then they'll just be on their best behavior exactly. to hit the mark. Yeah. And I mean, I too am a performer at heart, so I would think, okay, how can I be mm-hmm. right yeah. and not necessarily real? Yeah. Um, but this work is, is real because when it happens in real life, this is where your unconscious comes into to play and yeah. your you know your your trained habits um, are the ones that win out over you trying to be 
perfectly calculated at, mm-hmm. at every moment. That's just not realistic. Yeah. So yeah, going in and, and changing our own software and hardware internally is like a, that's a long, <laughs> a lifelong process. Yeah. So I think we've covered p- plenty. I would love to know just lastly, how can we learn more about Vantage Point, support you, or bring Vantage Point to our workplace? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a website. It's www.trivantagepoint.com. Our Twitter is at Vantage Point VR or the Morgan Mercer. And feel free to reach out to us via website, form submission, or email. We're happy to send a demo, get Vantage Point into the workplace. And awesome. uh, we love to talk to people about the problem. And are you excited about anything specifically this coming year with the company? Um, yeah. So we just closed another funding round. Yeah. yeah. Um, working with some really amazing companies to solve some incredible issues. And we're excited to be putting out some research soon. Yay. Well, yeah. um, we're on board and we want to support. So everyone, make sure you give all of the accounts a good follow and keep your eyes open for more from them. And then bring them to your workplace. Um, I think, like I said earlier, my team's going to be doing a fun little VR field trip coming up. Love it. Yeah. Um, So thank you for being here and uh, we will see you next time. Thank you for having me. Thanks. All right. That was a lot to digest. That was a major download today um, and it's time for this week's mantras. I will give you three affirmations and things you can repeat after me to um, help transform your own thinking. And if you want, write them down, um, you know, put them on their, on your mirror as a reminder on your phone so you can actually make um, a calculated effort to change your behavior and obviously <laughs> your life and the world. So starting with number one. I realize that my bias leads me to see others as I am and not as they are. I realize that my bias leads me to see others as I am and not as they are. And your turn. Number two, I am committed to my own self-awareness. I am committed to my own self-awareness. And number three is a bit of a book, so I'm going to do all three of them with you. Equality is giving everyone the same thing to be successful. Equity is honoring the individual's experience and unique needs to give the opportunity for an equal outcome. Equality is giving everyone the same thing to be successful. Equity is honoring the individual's experience and unique needs to give the opportunity for an equal outcome. And last time, equality is giving everyone the same thing to be successful. Equity is honoring the individual's experience and unique needs to give the opportunity for an equal outcome. So much to learn forever more. Thank you as always for tuning in. If you think this can help inspire someone, please do share it. Make sure you take a moment to rate and review the podcast and um, DM me and comment on all the posts so I know what your favorite takeaways were. And I will see you next time for more Simplexity. It's anything but small talk. Peace.